All right, dear everyone, thank you very much for attending the launch of Social Enterprise in China, written by Professor Benedict Berger. It is my honor here to welcome you all, and also on the behalf of the Department of Communication and Culture to applaud Benedict's masterpiece. A little bit of myself, my, my name is Di Wong, Professor and Head of Department of Communication and Culture at BI. Uh, Benedict got her PhD from University of Oslo in the Department of Social Anthropology. Um, she also has been the research director at the Work Institute uh, before she became the professor at BI. I got to know Benedicta some time ago when she was still the associate dean for the BI Fudan MBA program. So from time to time we talk when she returned to Oslo or when we visit uh, Fudan for Wizard Seminar some years ago. Uh, it has been a fantastic time talking to Benedicta and personally I have always been very impressed by her in-depth knowledge of the business and fat women in China and not the least the culture. Um, and so coming back to this book and goes without saying uh, the importance of social enterprise in uh, enhancing uh, community development, but also as a major force for disruptive innovation is really well recognized. This is a very complicated topic, but I'm very really impressed by Benedict's work can articulate it in such a systematic way. And not the least, she tried to understand the meaning of it, and the meaning is always contextual, and that she approached that from an anthropology angle to trying to tell us how social enterprise can manifest in the West, can be different in the East. And so, again, we're honored to be here today, and I'm very looking forward to the panel discussion later in this event. And with that, I just want to give the floor to uh, Robert uh, Solomon, the researcher from the Ostromat, to open up the floor. And thank you. Thank you for the nice words, Suki uh, Wong. And I'm very happy to be here, I'm, and I will try to, to be heading uh, this uh, session. We start with uh, Benedicte, but uh, already now I would uh, just say that uh, we will have comments from uh, Cixi Fan from uh, Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences. She is uh, a sociologist, but uh, she is also a media researcher. And of course, uh, she knows quite a lot uh, in this field we are going to discuss today. And after that, uh, Henning Christoffersen, uh, will come in. He has uh, 20 years experience uh, of innovation in China. Uh, he is uh, linked to uh, the governance group, but for the time being, he is um, a PhD uh, st st student at the um, uh, Sociolo Anthropological Institute. I hope to say sociological because that's my background, you know. Uh, and then we will have a panel discussion after those presentations. But first of all, to the main person today, uh, Benedicte Brugger, congratulations with your book. I look forward to listen to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. And thank you for those kind words, uh, Suti. And um, I'm very happy to be here uh, and with this such accomplished panel, uh, with this, the launch of this book today, uh, which I'm the, I'm the very happy author. Uh, but a book always starts something new, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the panel and what they read from this book and the perspectives further on. I will talk about the book first. Um, it's now, it's available, it's formally available. Uh, here is the table of content. It has three parts. The first part is... Um, overview of the global social enterprise discourse starting in Silicon Valley, and then how it was adapted and absorbed in China. Then follows four empirical chapters with cases of social enterprise in China uh, and the complications in, uh, involved in starting such a um, initiative. And then finally, the three 
end chapters of the book are findings, conclusions, and some pieces of advice. And I'll give you some uh, tidbits or tastes of what of the content of the book in the, this introduction. First of all, what is social enterprise? Um, it's defined um, in a, can be defined in several ways. The broad definition is that it's an initiative, non-governmental initiative, to solve a social problem, alleviate the pain, help people with a handicap, the shame of illiteracy, uh, the isolation of, uh, according to sexual orientation, lack of access to work, the numerous social needs, and to work together with, uh, collaborate with beneficiaries of the initiatives is a definition of social enterprise. Then there's a narrow definition that's of an enterprise like a business company uh, and uh, organize or operate according to business principles. And then finally, the third definition, which is common in China, is of a productivist welfare program. And that means a program that aims for economic development and infrastructure development as a means to improve the quality of life. So these three definitions are used in the book. My focus is on the narrow the definition of narrow enterprises. After all, I come from a business school, but uh, all of them are included with examples. In the book, I operate with three eras to organize the mass of information. And in particular, the Deng Xiaoping era was when social innovation was included in the national innovation system. That's the NIS acronym there, National Innovation System. That made a huge change and is part of the market reforms in China at that time. And the current era of the current president, Xi, uh, that is when social policy reforms, vast social policy reforms have been uh, introduced. And of course, this changes the conditions for social enterprise. And there are many discussions about China these days. Where's China heading? Uh, in terms of economic growth, freedom of expression, climate, military ambitions, really, really big issues. On the other hand, social needs are small everyday issues and they don't go away. They continue, they're there always. And that's where social enterprise comes into the picture and the efforts of all the social entrepreneurs in China. And they do change China in small, myriads of small ways. And that's what I've tried to map in the book. Um, how do they change China? By altering the social contract. And there's a lot of theory behind this. So the idea of social contract was coined at the time of industrialization in France with many of the same challenges uh, as of today in society and with the state and the relation between state and society. And here in, in China, the state is composed of all I define that as the tax funded public administration at all levels from the central and down to, to the lowest level. And that includes about 80 million people. That's a huge number. But in relation to society, that's the rest, that's more than 1.3 1 1 .3 billion people. The state is very, very small, but it is very, very influential in the Chinese Communist Party and the government uh, units. And the social contract, it what is regulates the relations between these two uh, parts of China and also within society in, at, at various levels. And how is it changed? Let me see if I can uh, go on here. What I have mapped are the patterns of exchange that take place with between uh, these two entities and then how changes happen, changes to these patterns of exchange. And then I discussed, are these changes lasting or are they just uh, an ad hoc solution to a uh, situation? And there are signs of lasting changes because of these changes in the patterns of exchange. And I use uh, patterns of exchange, I use the term discursive topology to indicate that this is a, it's a model, it's an analytical model. I use three, significant patterns that I am um, to put uh, analyze the material in. 
The first one is relations between party cadres, villagers, around land and rent. It's a very powerful configuration in China. Another one is uh, we all of us know is, in, is a market, it's a commercial configuration, buyer and seller, commodities and price mechanism, supply and demand. I mean, that's uh, elementary, at least in the business school. But there's a third one that we call the capitalist configuration, relations between owners and managers in, in uh, relation to capital and profit. And these three, a person can fill all three positions, but not at the same time and not do the same within them. So these are patterned relations. And what the uh, social enterprises do is they change these patterns. Let me see. Uh, they change this discursive topology. And two examples uh, from the book. One is known as the Taobao village. And that is a village where more than 100 of the villagers have opened a store on the e-commerce platform, uh, Taobao. That's owned by Alibaba, a huge tech giant that everybody has heard about. Um, and that's the first one was in 2009, and it has seen spread. And there's today about 500 million people living in villages and towns in China. Uh, there's 6,000 of these Taobao villages. And the villages get together. Some have started a sports apparel. Others rent out houses to a nearby big market. Others uh, improve the produce from the lo local uh, area. So there are many ways that they engage in, in, uh, to, to improve the economic condition uh, in a more productivist uh, definition. But what they do is they take houses and land are appearing in the commercial pattern of exchange, the market pattern of exchange. Houses and services become more commodities than they used to. And that's a tiny change, but it changes also the relations in the wider circles. The other example is an, an education institution, the QS Academy, that was started to improve uh, literacy, but not by rote learning, uh, but by critical reading, debate skills, uh, reading of poetry, reading of art, philosophy, as well as engineering. So it's a much more, it's kind of civilizing social mission in a town that was dying, as the uh, uh, social entrepreneurs uh, diagnosed it, because all the adults had left for work or education, and who the, were left were the grandparents and the children. And here, one of the grandmothers offered this enterprise um, a location for free. And she said that this was, she owned it and her grandfather had set it up in 1920s. And China hadn't had private property for many decades, but all stakeholders accepted her claim of ownership to this building so the enterprise could move in there. And that's also another change, bringing back uh, or bringing into another configuration, this, uh, the position of owner. These are just two examples of how social enterprise change China. It's not simple. Social enterprise is not simple anywhere, but there's some special aspects of the conditions in China that's worth mentioning and create paradoxical situations that social enterprises need to deal with. And I'll, I'll not go through all of them here, but uh, one example is the the, the difference between civilized society. The social enterprises that I see them in China are much more concerned with civilized society, not in the sense of civil society, that is the, the, the traditional use of the term, but of being a proper human being, being a cultivated human being, operating properly and being learned. And that is in to achieve social welfare, to improve society, improve China, their homeland. But that goes in a sense against the productivist uh, way of doing social enterprise, investing in infrastructure and the social enterprises are caught here in, in, in the double. And then another example, the mar being marginal or being central in order to work with marginalized groups, the social entrepreneurs need to be where they are 
uh, listen and accept that situation and work from those premises together with um, the beneficiaries. And that means that they are being pushed and pulled by the same marginalization forces that those marginalized people experience. But in order to gain legitimacy, to gain resources, acceptance, they need to position themselves as very central, mainstream, proper um, organizations and people. So they must balance in this paradoxical, uh, you, can, you have to do both when you really can't do both. And they do, and that they manage to do that. So it's not a kind of linear, you do either or, but it's balanced and it's moving. Um, it's more about that in, in, in uh, the book, of course. And finally, what do successful entrepreneurs in China do? And what could those who are interested in doing social enterprise in China uh, advise on what to prepare for uh, based on the experiences and uh, discussions in the book? Well, first to match mission and location. Everything can't be done in all of the locations in China. And if the mission and the location does not fit, one has to change. The other example is to welcome what I have called committed barefoot revolutionaries. That may be people who don't have the formal education, but who have the engagement and uh, the interest and want to contribute. One example is a very, very successful and a professional administrator who really in her heart wanted to be a teacher. And she was allowed to become a teacher in one of the organizations. Uh, she is a kind of barefoot revolutionary because she wanted to change uh, the literacy and the, the, the civilized uh, part. And finally, they stay true to the social mission. And that is a, a guiding star uh, under pressure from uh, profit-oriented stakeholders or political change-oriented or ethical uh, requirements, they stay true to the social mission, which means it has to be clearly defined. And that is takes a, a considerable courage and humor and nerve. But by doing this, they do contribute to change China and to improve China. More about this then in the book. Um, it's not too many pages. Um, and with this, thank you for your attention. And I give the word to the panel. Thank you, Mendicta, uh, for a nice introduction and for the nice book. Uh, I have a lot to, to say about the book. I can say it uh, to you privately or maybe somewhat uh, afterwards. But first of all, we have to listen to Sishi. And uh, I uh, told a little bit about you, but you may tell a little bit more than I said about uh, who you are and what you are doing. And then uh, you're free to say almost everything. Huh? Okay, thank you. Thank oh, you. Go on. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, actually, now I'm at home and uh, the time here is uh, maybe uh, uh, it's, uh, 10 o'clock, uh, maybe 20 uh, at night. So <laughs> um, here is my pleasure, really pleasant to be here, to be invited by uh, Professor Proger to uh, attend this new book launch conference here. And uh, for me, it's really uh, pleasant to have the experience to read the book uh, in advance. And uh, uh, during the uh, reading, uh, when I saw some very familiar things there, such like the uh, layer, the pyramid in uh, the book, I can remember it very clear that um, uh, me and uh, Professor Roger, we talked about that uh, in her office in BI the Academy. Uh, that's a really nice appearance, uh, maybe two, uh, two years ago when I was in BI. So uh, today for me, it's really my pleasure to be here to have some comments. Uh, actually not, I just want to uh, maybe share some 
uh, feelings or maybe some thinking about the uh, content in in the book, uh, or uh, maybe I can add some information to this book because maybe for me, the Chinese people when I uh, read the book, I will always think about my experience and my of. Uh, observation about this kind of social uh, enterprise in China. Uh, so I think it's it's very initiative and insightful uh, opinion to uh, recognize this phenomenon nowadays in China. Uh, but uh, uh, maybe uh, for quite a lot of people, uh, because this is our daily life, we may not notice this very clearly. So I think it's a quite good opportunity for me to thank, thank, uh, uh, thank uh, Professor uh, Berger to give me this kind of uh, concept and uh, the items in this book to uh, articulate our uh, daily experience to some series and to some analysis here. Uh, so for me, um, actually last year, Yes, last year I uh, have created a, a book page, a, a, a book page on the website in China. Uh, I submit this uh, book, uh, the cover and the uh, content, uh, the menu of this book to the uh, website. I want to create a new item for this book. Uh, I think maybe uh, last year I did this work, and uh, today I could send the link here, and you can check the. Uh, books uh, link online in China's uh, website called Douban. But uh, uh, I didn't uh, expect that uh, the, the this kind of proces procedure nowadays um, spend such a, uh, cost us quite a lot of time because nowadays I haven't get the proof to uh, to see the link. So um, I think maybe nowadays in the environment of the internet of uh, China uh, change a lot, just like the Professor Berger said that maybe you can see quite a lot of changes in China, but uh, some uh, changes will last for long, but something will uh, stop at some moment. Um, I, I think uh, when I read this book, there is something that remind me very, uh, uh, remind me of that is uh, the questions maybe on the professor that said, why China? Why this kind of phenomenon nowadays happen in China? So I always think about this uh, uniqueness for this kind of uh, social enterprise in China. Why this uh, happened nowadays in China? So uh, maybe just for me, uh, I, I think this book gave me quite a lot of information and uh, very informative for me to know more about uh, my country. So uh, just like the Taobao village, actually for the uh, Yangtze River Delta area, Taobao village is very famous. I know quite a lot of students, they got their PhD doctor, just use this uh, example to uh, do the, uh, uh, to write the census and got their PhD. Uh, so, uh, and they, did quite a lot of field work to this village and to do interviewer and to uh, observe uh, the, the, the people there, the villagers, they, how they um, do the business there, use the uh, Taobao website, use the social media, and use the platform and use the uh, delivery system to do this business. So it, it's very famous uh, and in China. But uh, the other two examples, uh, for me, uh, I think maybe it gives me more uh, information and knowledge about my country. Even for me, I may be the first time to know that, but it's uh, really um, insightful because I think maybe uh, not all of us will think about that. It's a, a very in innovative or maybe this is a, a initiative phenomena nowadays in China, just like the uh, QS Academy and something like this kind of self-organized uh, uh, institute. Uh, they did quite a lot of work for the local people and they, very, they have uh, uh, the aim and they, uh, they have the res responsibility to do some work for their own and for maybe for their uh, labor and for their partners or for, for their people. So uh, it, it is very innovative maybe uh, before we pay not so much attention on it. Um, 
quite a lot of time uh, we say that uh, nowadays in China, we use the internet technology to empower the people to give them more opportunities or maybe more uh, power to get access to the new uh, opportunity. Uh, just like the um, Douyin, it is the uh, TikTok, uh, it is, it is uh, very like to the TikTok, but it can be used in China because TikTok cannot be used in the mainland. And uh, uh, Kuai Shou is very sim similar to uh, Douyin. Uh, if you use the two uh, short video uh, APP, uh, you will see that quite a lot, lot of villagers they use this to uh, give some live show and to sell their uh, products and to uh, get more attention and uh, maybe to be uh, very famous uh, online. So uh, this kind of thing online to uh, promote themselves, maybe another uh, new practice for the people nowadays in China, they want to uh, get access or maybe get connection to the outside world and uh, maybe to empower themselves. Um, but, uh, uh, maybe two years ago, uh, before the COVID-19. I think we went to a very poor uh, province in the, uh, in the north, uh, in the northwest in China called the Gansu province. That, that's very, uh, the, the area of that, uh, 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 this area is very poor. But when we get there, we find that they don't have the speed train, but they have very high speed uh, internet. Uh, uh, we went to the primary school and we saw quite a lot of students, uh, uh, the primary students, uh, they, uh, they don't have the broadcasting system, but they have the internet. So they just uh, click the, uh, the, uh, the live show online uh, to get more music and to get the uh, video for their uh, class. So uh, at that time, uh, because they are very poor, uh, Maybe you cannot imagine how uh, how poor they are. I can give you some data that there, um, because uh, uh, maybe uh, they don't have the uh, quite a lot of uh, resource. So the annual income of uh, there, every people maybe only two hundred euro a year. Yes, it's under the two thousand three hundred yuan of renminbi, but uh, maybe just the 200 euro for their uh, annual income. Uh, at that time, they, they are very poor, but they are eager to maybe have the uh, access to opportunity to get connected to the outside. So they use the internet and to maybe do some mm -hmm. online show and to uh, sell their products. They got very good Apple. Uh, before the Apple, maybe nobody knows about that. So uh, they cannot sell them, but if they use the internet to sell the Apple and uh, just one Apple, they can sell it at uh, one euro. Uh, that's very expensive for them to see. And uh, uh, when we at the primary school, we saw that the students there, uh, the maybe uh, the first or the second grant primary school students, they learn how to uh, code. They uh, use some software and they, they download quite a lot of uh, the video and uh, maybe they have the uh, uh, they have the uh, teacher to teach them how to code and the students there they are very eager to know how to learn this kind of skill. Uh, maybe here we know that uh, uh, for the primary school students uh, they. Uh, just to teach them how to code. Maybe there are some discussion about that, uh, if it is suitable for such a small children to learn uh, code. But there in the very poor area, they feel that it's very confident and uh, maybe uh, feel they can, uh, they, they may be equal to the uh, other area uh, in China. And uh, they, uh, they maybe think it's a kind of a skill for them to be uh, go outside their village to see the outside world. So for me, I think maybe it's a new kind of uh, practice or behavior for Chinese people nowadays. They just uh, uh, maybe not have this kind of uh, 
self-awareness that they could do this uh, self-organization uh, in the reality, uh, in the real world, but maybe they use the technology, the internet technology to organize online, to uh, promote or maybe to rebuild their own life. So I think maybe this book gave me more uh, inspired uh, thing, uh, thinking about this uh, phenomenon. And thank you very much for the Professor Broger. And uh, I, I think maybe uh, later I can send you the new book uh, link for you to, to see that your book can be seen in the Chinese website. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Sisi. Uh, uh, interesting to, to hear from uh, you and especially uh, maybe about uh, the internet and uh, all the possibilities there, which we may be di discussing later. Uh, in addition to be impressed by uh, your comments, your speech, I'm also impressed by all the books you have behind you. And I just wonder, have you read all of them? Uh, uh, you don't have to, to answer because we are uh, going on. And uh, the next on the list is uh, Henning Christophsen. I told a few words about you some minutes ago, but uh, fine if you also can add some comments. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Fang Shusha. Very interesting to hear uh, your uh, take on uh, Benedict de Berger's uh, book. I've actually worked at um, BI, Norwegian Business School, for several years myself. Um, and I've also uh, worked in, uh, at Fudan University in Shanghai, where uh, BI has their uh, most of their corporations. Um, as part of my background for, and for my interest in, in China. Um, uh, congratulations, uh, Benedict on your book. Fantastic. I, I, I must say, as an anthropologist myself, uh, I think it was uh, an injection of fresh uh, air to, to read uh, this book um, for several reasons, and I'll get back to that. But, uh, but I think uh, these days there is, um, there is um, strong forces to polarize uh, when we talk about or describe uh, China and the developments in China to make sense of China. Uh, and like um, Bergen more than uh, uh, hints to in her uh, introduction, a lot of the interpretations, uh, particularly in the Western world, uh, they tend or they may very often be ideologically based or they may be historical, uh, historically or orientally biased or, or, or not up to date. So, so I think this, um, to me, this book was really a bit of fresh air uh, with, with uh, uh, a different focus to understand China uh, from within. And then also with your uh, input, uh, Fang Shishu, I'm also, uh, and we are a bit more wiser on what's going on in China because the, the complexity uh, of the Chinese society and the complexity of the Chinese development, like Bregu says in her book, uh, sometimes it's better to think of China as a continent than as a country with all the vast uh, uh, differences, both in, uh, uh, like, like you also point to, you know, uh, the, the incomes, living standards, uh, geography, uh, the enormous population and so forth. Uh, and also as an anthropologist uh, interested in business, I always find it very uh, refreshing when uh, an anthropologist include uh, uh, researchers or, or, or professors such as Michael Porter, the business strategist. Not many anthropologists actually uh, do that. So, so that's, a, that's a, a good one for me. Uh, I have, um, uh, my, my take on this is that um, I, I have taken three, three concepts, if you will, or, or, or uh, three topic subjects that I find that this book is um, contributing or, or, or enlightening us. Uh, and uh, the first one is um, on understanding the, the Chinese authoritarianism, uh, actually, what, what that is. So I will say a little bit about that. Secondly, uh, welfare and market forces in China. Uh, and thirdly, this idea that uh, Berger also mentioned a little bit in her introduction, uh, which I found very, um, very interesting, this, this idea of um, being a cultural being, to put it like that, uh, and, and the cultural being as opposed to a, a, a productive uh, being. So because the, these, I think all these three aspects uh, can be 
um, easier to understand uh, when we um, read how uh, Benedikte Brugger explains this uh, through her focus on social enterprise and social entrepreneurs. Uh, authoritarianism. I think we, uh, I think these days we actually we actually lack good concepts to describe what China is from to understand the political system in China. We very often uh, jump to conclusions such as calling it a dictatorship or, or or label it, and we label it with the labels we have. So it's it's very difficult to understand what what China is, and that's not in in a way it's not we shouldn't be surprised about it because China is also an experiment in itself. Chinese leaders, political leaders, Chinese people, all like like you said, you know, Farshisha, this is also. It, it's complex for Chinese people to understand, you know, and uh, then you can imagine how it is for us looking in, you know. But I do think that we we lack uh, we lack maybe words or, or 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 an understanding of what what the Chinese authoritarianism, if you will, what, what it actually is. And I think um, one one thing is that which Benedict Berry also mentions is is the the Chinese statecraft. Uh, this the statecraft. Uh, as um, how do how do we build how do you govern uh, uh, society uh, how do you govern uh, China the statecraft of the of the political leadership if you will and then I think it's interesting to look at it from from a Western point of view we very often focus on the repressive uh, part of this you no know? the repressive part of governing. But actually, I think what we often underestimate is also the, uh, le le the legitimacy of uh, the Communist Party. So if you look at how, um, how an authoritarian state governs, it's usually a combination of, uh, yes, repression, but also legitimation and, and thirdly, co-optation. And what is co-optation? Co-optation means how do you communicate how do you, as a, how do, how is state and society? How uh, do they negotiate? How do they work together? What sort of room is actually there? Uh, and the normal definition of cooptation is for the govern the governor, the governing party, the political leaders. How do they um, how do they connect with the elites of society? But, uh, and this is basically then the, one of the main topics of this book, the social contract between uh, the, the state and society. And I think it's extremely interesting approach to look at this through social entrepreneurs, because this actually shows in a, in a very vivid way how there is actually room in this authoritarian society. There is room. There is a lot of sophistication needed to be able to succeed as a social entrepreneur in China, uh, because you have to understand the risks of uh, of your initiatives. Actually, and this is um, this can be illustrated by uh, the fact that if you start a social enterprise, it can actually be a critique in itself of something lacking uh, in the state, right? The state delivers welfare, but there's something lacking. And therefore, there is room for a social enterprise. So if you start a social enterprise in an authoritarian state like China, this in itself can be a critique of the state. So you have to be really smart about how you sort of negotiate with the state. So, so I think that the first point here that, that this this uh, call it i don't know i don't think Brugge calls it negotiation but in any sense this type of communication negotiation between society between social entrepreneurs and the state is actually uh, an illustration of the um, the non static nature of the social contract in china and we very often at least from a from an outside perspective or, or a western perspective very often jump to the conclusion of this social contract uh, or maybe we wouldn't even call it a social contract. We will focus on the repressive part, but I think this is um, it's very well. well um, yeah, I think I think it's uh, enlightening uh, to understand what to get a better understanding of what this uh, authoritarian development in China is actually uh, about. Um, yeah, let me think if I yeah. 
Secondly, um, welfare and market forces. Uh, I think it's also uh, this focus on social uh, enterprise and social entrepreneurs also gives a very good, uh, good um, picture, uh, understanding uh, of how this works. If you try to um, imagine, if you think about any society, be it Norway or be it China or Italy, whatever, and you think about two things, you think about uh, uh, in relation to trust, think of it on a, on a high level, just as a, as a concept, you think about trust. And then you think about how does individuals in any given society trust two things? How do they trust uh, welfare? Meaning when they pay taxes, what do they get back from the state? Pen pensions, uh, social health care, education, right? When you pay taxes, what is the trust in what you get back from the state? That's number one, welfare. Number two, institutions. So if you look a bit largely at institutions, do we in, in a society trust that if we stand in line to get any type of service uh, from the community or from the state, do we trust that we will get that service when we are in that line or will it be corrupt? So we will have to go back and back or maybe never get it, right? So the level of trust we as individuals have in a society to welfare and um, to, to welfare, and to institutions, right? Depending on that level of trust, you can have some expectations of behavior, correct? If you have very low level of trust in these two uh, things, how will you behave as an individual in the same society? So when this trust is low, you, will, you can assume that in that society with a low trust in these things, you will have a very, very strong focus on the individual level on a simple thing like making money. Because money is the thing that creates predictability for you, right? And since you do not have trust in these things in the first place, then you have to make money fast because you do not trust other people to take care of the money for you, to put it like that, right? And how do you get money? Well, you do not trust... Uh, the government or the state uh, for welfare and, and you don't trust the institutions, well, then you need to make your own predictability and make it, uh, and create networks of people that you trust. In China, this is called Guanxi. In other countries, it's called something else. So low level of trust, uh, behavior uh, to uh, achieve a social network and to... Uh, uh, have income, right? And this actually, if you have low level of trust, this drives a short-term behavior. In business, uh, cultural courses or whatever, we, it's all, one of the first things you hear that in China, yes, you need to have focus on the long-term because in China, it's long-term. They have a government with 100-year goals and four-year plans and so forth, right? But actually, many people, when people go to China, they have then experienced a very short-term orientation, which is very surprising. But actually, this short-term orientation is very logic, right, from this simple model. Because the short-term orientation on the individual level is actually the only way of getting resources to yourself so that you can plan long-term as an individual or a family. So for the Chinese case, I would say that, and, and there's been uh, uh, a lot of writings uh, on this. Uh, one is by a uh, famous sociologist, Min Xin Pei, who calls this, this here is actually China's crony capitalism, which we have had for, for, for several decades. And I think that's, that's, quite, that's quite an interesting perspective because this crony capitalism uh, in the book, um, has not, this, is, this is my my words, but uh, in the book, uh, Breger talks about predatory competition and asks the question, will China turn into a dictatorship? Will it be predatory uh, competition, right? Uh, and um, uh, I, I, she doesn't conclude, but I think this is an extremely interesting, um, the, to look at social enterprise in this is extremely interesting. 
And then getting to my last uh, point, which is uh, the cultural being. And this is actually uh, a dimension that we maybe overlook because maybe people haven't uh, uh, thought about the development in China like I just described. But uh, in any case, this, this dimension in China of thinking of the, the cultural being as opposed to the, the Western uh, focus on um, self-centered motivation as actually the core of a capitalist society. This is Adam Smith's, uh, uh, if you self-centered motivation in an economy is good. It's good for the economic development, both on an individual level and on a social level. It drives society, right? But uh, Bruegge's focus on the cultural being explicitly, I think it's extremely interesting. And I haven't thought about it uh, like that before because, and she introduces this uh, uh, concept of as a company, any company, if you're a social enterprise or, or a regular company, this, this concept of being unsocial, meaning more leaning towards this self-centered capitalist focus as something good, a good driver for economic growth, right? To be unsocial, sort of like this, there is no acceptance for that in the Chinese uh, way of thinking. So on the one hand, and this is, uh, what is always uh, challenging and fascinating about the Chinese uh, society, that it's so complex and it's full of, at least for people like me looking in, full of paradoxes. So you have this development that I just described, which can also be described as predatory uh, competition, uh, which is a term that Berger uses. But at the same time, you have this, um, this Chinese trait or historical understanding to, that to be this unsocial being, it's actually an unsocial company. It, it's, it's no acceptance for it. And if you do not, as a Chinese, take care of your, your network, your guanxi, if you will, your closest, you are basically not, if the individualism goes to that level, you are basically a non, uh, a non human. So, so I think these, to me, at least, these, um, these three concepts, uh, to understand them through, uh, through this book's focus on uh, social enterprise and social entrepreneurs, what's really gave me some, some, really some food for thought. Authoritarianism, uh, welfare and market forces, and this concept of, of uh, the cultural uh, being, if you will. So, um, yeah, I think uh, with that, I will uh, stop and hopefully we have created some ground for some questions or discussions and uh, apologies, uh, Benedicti, if we didn't understand you, uh, but we tried. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Henning. Uh, I think Benedict uh, also, it seems that it is a uh, room for you here. Uh, and uh, Sishi, is, uh, we can see you very well on, yeah, on the wall. Uh, a lot of things to think about, a lot of things to discuss. Um, Benedict, uh, you asked some questions already in the invitation to, to this uh, book launch. Uh, how to deal with social entrepreneurship when changing priorities change. That's an important issue. How to use the digitization for inclusion. And uh, Sishi talked uh, quite a lot about uh, that already. Uh, how to strengthen those who do invisible work for the community. I would ask just the same question concerning those who are doing invisible work in Norway as well. Um, and um, how uh, collaboration may strengthen inclusion. But uh, first of all, after I have listening, been listening to you now, I think it's so uh, fascinating to how you, in a way, unlocked the relationship between the state, 
uh, how at least we um, uh, interpret it in, in Norway, a sort of a formal structure, which also you talked about uh, now, an authoritarian structure and so on, uh, and the local community, what is really happening down there? I think that is very fascinating, and, and that's always uh, fascinating because the local story is very often another story than uh, the, the national story. And of course, that must be uh, the case more than in Norway in such an enormous uh, country as China with uh, such uh, a large uh, population. And um, then I think the main, my main question, first of all, that is how that relationship uh, function between the central uh, level, the political level, the party, uh, some sort of repression uh, represented there, and uh, what are the uh, possibilities for uh, the local uh, interventions, and what are the possibilities for empowerment at the local level. So I would like to, to start there. And um, since Sishi uh, started the um, First, maybe you, Henning, may start with some comments there. You already gave some in your speech, but... Uh... Yeah. Um, no, I, th I, think this is, um, I think this is an ongoing negotiation. And I think this comes out very clearly in the book also, that this is not a set way. It's not a set rule. And it's not always... It's not easy to understand what you can do, what you cannot do, what type of initiatives are, are uh, okay and what are not. And it, it, it comes sometimes down to maybe even an individual level. How, how is your understanding of where are uh, the limits? And then also it comes down to then your, your contacts, your, your level of contacts and um, both to understand, but also to, to, um, to negotiate on, on an individual level on where the boundaries, where the boundaries actually are. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you used um, three. Um, you used discursive theory, Quan Xi, and uh, what was the third one to try to decipher or to total social fact? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> anyway, I think this 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 is also where this network Quan Xi contact part comes in. So I would say mm. yeah, it's, it's hard, but it's I think it's an ongoing uh, negotiation because there are no. Uh, clear boundaries. I, I must say that uh, not being familiar to the uh, concepts either, I would like to learn a little bit more also about Congis, which you mentioned quite uh, a lot, and also the country, as you mentioned now, because it seems that there are certain uh, type of institutions at local level uh, that is uh, important also for social entrepreneurship. And what and these are uh, some of them are old uh, sort of institutions and how do they function to uh, promote um, uh, social entrepreneurship I would, I would very much like to, to have some more comments on that um, maybe you see here uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually for me um, I uh, I feel very excited when I the Guanxi, this word in Benedict's book, because uh, it's a very, uh, I, I think it's a very local word for us to say that the relationship between you and uh, the others, uh, maybe uh, between the different uh, objects and subjects between. Uh, so uh, the Guanxi is very important and very essential for Chinese people to uh, deal with the thing and uh, maybe to uh, deal with the relationship with the others. And uh, even we use this kind of uh, word or maybe we use this kind of thinking, this kind of perspective to uh, think about the distance between people and the others and maybe uh, ourselves and the others. So uh, but for me, I think maybe another word can uh, give some uh, uh, can, can maybe give some uh, complimentary uh, to this uh, concept, maybe the mian. I don't know if uh, Benedict knows this word, mian. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Chinese word. It's actually the meaning of mian means the face. 
Guanxi here means the relationship almost, uh, but means it means the face. But face here is very important for Chinese people because it comes the kind of uh, maybe uh, this, um, it means the authority and it means that you got the priority in some position and you can use this and the dynamics for you to deal with the things. Uh, I think maybe uh, I, I saw the uh, layer, the pyramid in your book, that's very familiar for me. And I think that's very insightful to, uh, to maybe articulate the relationship between the state and the uh, province and the village and the different layers there. Uh, you know that for Chinese people, uh, we have a socialist, uh, we have we, before uh, a socialist called Fei Xiaotong, they have the, I, uh, the uh, concept for Chinese people's relationship called the differentiation patterns the, for the Chinese people. We use these kind of patterns to deal with the people's relationship. Here, we also use some layered uh, way to deal with the state and the province and the village, such like this. And I also see something behind this pyramid, uh, just like some shadows there. I think maybe we also use this to maybe do some uh, compare, com to compare these two uh, relations. Uh, here, means I think maybe is on the top of our relationship. Uh, just not hearing said that uh, why people would like to do this when they uh, maybe uh, uh, when they deal with the relationship for uh, the people why they trust the others why they want to uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, give more um, help uh, maybe give more help or maybe uh, to trust the other people on something and the way you think that the other people will care about you. Here, uh, means here maybe have some uh, uh, some important uh, functions there because uh, maybe uh, if you know more details about the function or maybe the operation in the village, you know that there are some leaders there. And this, this leader is in the middle of the uh, top and the button and they have to report to the top, but they have to uh, maybe responsible, re responsible for the uh, grassroots. So here the leader has the means and this give their uh, maybe power and maybe uh, they have this uh, dialect to hold this situation in some order. So I think that's very, it actually uh, it's very uh, specific and maybe very detailed since inside the layers that are very interesting. Uh, and also for me, just for as uh, Chinese people, I think it's very complicated for us to understand because maybe if you don't live in the uh, rural air, uh, this kind of knowledge is not your knowledge, this uh, local knowledge there. So I think that's very interesting. Thank you. You want to comment on some of that? Yes. At least uh, you have some uh, comments for your next book. <laughs> yes, uh, I was also thinking that I'm doing a project here, you know, and exploring that aspect, um, which uh, is not in the book at all. Uh, it was very, very uh, enlightening uh, comment. Uh, I was thinking um, more your question of the um, uh, total social fact or the guanxi. Uh, and I read some an analysis that included also objects. So it wasn't only the way we usually talk about mm -hmm. it, it's only people. But then the objects in the exchanges are also part of what gives meaning to these relations. And it's not, you cannot just send, send out any object at all. It has to be proper for the situation and proper for the relationship. So you have to know more than just the social standing of a person. It's more, in a sense, complete uh, with both the immaterial and the material uh, to behave in a, in a proper way. And that's why I use the French term total social fact, mm -hmm. which is a mysterious uh, in anthropological theory. What does that really mean? Uh, what is a total social fact? Well, it's something that gives meaning in its completeness. And for me, in, in, in Chinese 
uh, or my understanding of, of the, the Chinese meaning as an interpretation is as a social, social fact. And it's very powerful in China for creating and for part of the Chinese statecraft. And by the way, I really enjoyed listening to your take on what I had written. <laughs> uh, and you really grasp important points. Uh, so that was uh, yeah. an answer. Yeah, just a, just a comment on because this concept of uh, Guanxi, when, when China really started uh, its, its growth, like uh, uh, 30, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, there was a lot of discussion. Now that China is becoming part of the global uh, community, globalization, trade, will then, what will stay Chinese and what will disappear? And then there was a, a debate on Guanxi because some uh, would then uh, argue that as the more globalized China becomes, the less it will, this, this concept of Guanxi will slowly disappear. While others, uh, argue that this is actually so intertwined into the Chinese culture and tradition that it's, it's, it's impossible to see that it will disappear. And then we had this development that I tried to put words to in China, where, where yes, you've had, a, you had growth, you've had globalization and become you know, intertwined in, in, in the global economy. But still, locally in China, there has been, been so much uh, um, still disruption and negotiations locally and and this uh, call it if you call it crony capitalism whatever you call it this this trust level and all these things you know uh, um, has and, and local politics execution of politics locally all these things has actually um, well now we know that Guanxi is definitely still <laughs> extremely important. May, some will even argue that it's more important. And I think that's, that's, also, um, that's also interesting. But um, I'm not sure if, but it's, it's, it's been quite common to, to talk, like you say, Fan Shusha, that you combine with, with uh, you know, this, um, the, 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 the face, face culture and the Guanxi relationship, and also this uh, gift economy, right? So these three, three things sort of in the combination. Um, and I think that's also interesting to this, this gift and reciprocity to build uh, Guanxi and also to give uh, face, right? So the gift in this is something that I think is interesting also with the whole, um, the whole focus on corruption in China today. Does that does that uh, influence this uh, at all? You know, I, I imagine it must, but I, I I wouldn't be able to to put words to how. But but that would be interesting to hear from you, Fang. If you have any. That's a very interesting question. Uh, just uh, as Fanning said that before we talk about that, we just uh, have some discussions that uh, with the uh, globalization or globalization. Uh, with this uh, procedure, um, if Chinese, uh, this kind of guanxi or means our traditional relationship uh, forms will disappear or will last for a long time and maybe change the formation, the, the formation of it. Uh, I think maybe uh, in, in South China, it has a very long history and maybe the culture, uh, the local culture here is uh, very rooted there. So um, even with the development of our country and we entered into the uh, globalization and with our um, modern development nowadays in China, I think uh, uh, both the two sides may, uh, may emerge uh, at the same time. Uh, yeah. I think maybe there's some also some um, different between different areas in China. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the East area, maybe uh, they have some kind of Guanxi formation, maybe more familiar to Western people, but maybe in the middle or maybe in the West area, they have more traditional culture and the maybe the system and the, uh, I think the Guanxi uh, has more important uh, function and um, rules in their daily life. And then maybe they, uh, they even have some economic development there, but still they have the uh, 
traditional ideas and the ideologies there, and to uh, maybe if they want to do something, they will follow their own traditional guanxi. Uh, so here, I think I, I don't have very uh, uh, maybe uh, stable data to show that if this can have some uh, relation, uh, have some relations with the uh, corruption or some something. But I think it's very um, maybe uh, maybe very Chinese uh, way for us to think about the distance between different people and the different things. Just uh, like Benedict said that it's a social fact. Uh, I think it's very uh, uh, insightful to see that Guanxi is just not some uh, uh, imaged things. Maybe it's very, uh, it, it's just the facts because it, it can be uh, built and it can be made and it can be exchanged. And sometimes we see that Guanxi is broken. <laughs> Something is broken, and uh, we should recover the uh, the guanxi like this. So I, I think that's very insightful to notice that uh, it has uh, this position in our in our life. Yes, I, I think we stop there for a while because um, it is a broader um, audience, even if we don't see people, you mm -hmm. know. And we have invited uh, people to come up with some questions. And uh, Lynn, uh, could you please uh, read the, at least uh, the first one? So uh, we have a question from Lisa Anderson. Uh, congratulations with the book, Benedicta. Looking forward to reading it. Um, as a business developer for social entrepreneurs in Norway, where I have experienced that the public sector are open to change their system and actually co-work and buy from social entrepreneurs. Uh, can the social, uh, Chinese social entrepreneurs aim for changing the system at the same high level, at a governmental level? <laughs> Quite the question. Uh, yes. Um, what do you want? Or shall I? Um, it's a very, very good question and also brings in the comparative with Norway which um, uh, the Norwegian government has supported social entrepreneurship, for example, with the, the purchase, uh, innovative purchase, using public purchases in support of uh, social uh, entrepreneurs' uh, initiatives. Um, there's two things here. One, if a social un entrepreneur should engage politically to change society. I'm not sure if that is what you ask, Lisa. Um, the other hand is, on the other hand, is if social entrepreneurs should go in actively engage with the government and try to change the way they interact and the rules that the government has for funding, for... Um, purchases of uh, social services and from what I know they do um, in China but China is a much more hierarchical society well, it's much larger and they have this institution called a government organized non-government organization which are nation nationwide organizations that work, for example, on behalf of the disabled. If you really want to change at the very central national level, you would have to put in your effort at that kind of organization. That would mean that you wouldn't work as closely face to face, for example, organizing a work unit for people with disabilities. You would have to make a choice. It would be very, very difficult for one person or one little organization to manage both. Uh, well, uh, I would like to comment a little sure. bit as well, because um, I have some experiences, uh, especially from Sri Lanka and India, but uh, from Norway as well, of course. And my main impression is that um, uh, a government, uh, as in Norway, uh, can uh, 
put a lot of means um, uh, for people to utilize, or they can may even have uh, some sort of uh, legislation or uh, even also some sort of agreement between the parties and so on. That what is really going on is at the local level. That, uh, that is uh, uh, my observation to in some of these countries. And for example, in, in India, which is also a very large uh, country, uh, my experience was that it was very difficult uh, to make uh, any progress in this direction at the national level, not even at the state uh, level, but uh, at the local level, there were great room for uh, social entrepreneurship. But uh, that is uh, just my observation and uh, there may, may be different observations of the places, of course. If, if I may add, it seems the Chinese system is eff effect efficient at is to adapt productive solutions. So social entrepreneurs be used as a kind of laboratory and the initiatives that turn out to work, they are taken into the public sector mm -hmm. and changed into public programs in a more systematic way than we do in Norway. Uh, I have a follow up from Lisa as well. Uh, she says, I see a willingness from the highest level in Norway to change type top bottom uh, driven change. Is it the same in China or is it more bottom up driven change in changes in China? For me or she should you have to answer? Uh, I think it's open. <laughs> <laughs> or Henning, I mean you. Anyone who want to. From uh, function, so uh... oh, here, um, the leading from the highest level in Norway to change um, top to bottom. So you say that uh, yeah. in China, if we want to do this kind of uh, reformation, uh, the the direction is from the top to the bottom, or from the bottom to the top. Um, I think maybe if you ask me for the driven. Uh, driven power or for the uh, driven force. I, I think maybe in China, this kind of top to button maybe is the main screening force for us to know that this kind of, if we have this kind of reformation. Uh, yeah. But here, because uh, I think maybe the situation nowadays in China, uh, it, it changed. Um, so uh, maybe you can see some phenomena or we can see some cases there. Uh, that we still have some uh, willing and from the button to the top, maybe we would like to uh, push something to some direction for the welfare and for the, uh, for the uh, grassroots, their benefit. So uh, maybe nowadays you can see some cases in, in China. Uh, firstly, uh, you know that we, we, know, uh, we, know we can have uh, several children in our family nowadays because we only can have one, two, one child in one family. But nowadays we, we, have, we, we could have several children in our family. Uh, maybe it, it is for your, for Northern people, it, 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 is the, it, it is your free willing. But for Chinese people, maybe before we cannot do this, we, we, should, we maybe uh, face quite a lot of very complicated uh, situation there. But nowadays, uh, we have this kind of policy that uh, maybe one family they can have several children. Uh, for this kind of policy, actually, it is the change from the top to the bottom, because we should have this kind of policy and we can do this. But uh, how to execute this policy? Because not all the, pe not the people or, or the other family, they would like to have children nowadays in China very strange, right? Because uh, maybe nowadays for the young people uh, in China, uh, quite a lot of young people, they don't want to have family. They don't want to get married. They don't want to have a child because they think that's very hard work day. So uh, how to execute this kind of policy is a problem. So this kind of, uh, to make this kind of change, we have this, from the bottom to the top, we uh, maybe can uh, apply some uh, welfare from the government. Maybe we could say that we should enforce 
some kind of welfare for the uh, people, especially for the women, uh, such like this. So you can say if you want to have some changes, this kind of social change, maybe uh, both from the top to the button and from the button to the top, they have the overlap or have the dual direction. And maybe uh, the two kind of forces will go to, will, will go to the uh, same direction, they will make it possible. Uh, are there any more questions here? Yes, we got one from Peder Inge Pushet. Can you please uh, speak a little bit louder? Of course. Uh, so this question is from Peder Inge Fuset to Benedikte Brønger. Uh, congratulations on the new book. It seems very interesting. My question to you is that, uh, what are the two to three main points you would like to tell BI's master's management students that they should pick up from the book? <laughs> <laughs> Oh. One point is the power of business to make change and business methods. Uh, and I think you expressed it very well, Henning, with this um, attention to... Uh, um, I tried to um, put up a um, dichotomy uh, that in, in China, it's, it's worse to be unsocial than to uh, go for a profit. We have this, either you're social or you go for a profit. That's usually the dichotomy that we operate. If you are a commercial enterprise, you are after profit earnings. If you're a social enterprise, you're after uh, a social uh, achievement. Mm -hmm. But in China, uh, having uh, starting something and having a profit isn't doesn't seem to be that problematic. Of course, if you do well and people are willing to pay for that, that is that's okay, that's nice. But it's much worse to be unsocial if you are not committed to your relations, if you are not contributing to society. That is worse than saying that we are here in to make a surplus, economic surplus. So I think, uh, Pedringa, I don't know if I have three messages, uh, but one message is that uh, what businesses need do is to meet needs, people's needs, uh, and to focus uh, on the social and cultural aspects of that. And I would <laughs> go as far as say at that sort of culture building role of business. I know that's an uh, unusual way to put it, but businesses as cultural institutions that actually contribute to develop culture and social quality of life is something that we tend to forget when we get focused on the self-interest and Adam Smith uh, mm. mentioned uh, Henning. At least that was part, partly an answer, I hope, uh, Pedringa. Uh, I... Uh, I noticed you talked about trust, which of course is uh, very imp important. Um, I wonder if you look at it historically, um, as you described the, 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 the state and the party had quite an influence also at the local level. And uh, in a way they uh, did the uh, social work, maybe social entre um, entrepreneurship part, at least the social part uh, of everything. Uh, sometimes when you have a situation like that, and also a big trust in, uh, in the party and the government, um, you create the sort of situation uh, called learned uh, helplessness in the sense that you trust so much uh, one party um, taking care of all your social aspects and you don't see the possibility uh, possibilities for yourself to do something. And at least in some other countries, I have observed quite a lot of this uh, sort of learned helplessness where uh, uh, so social entrepreneurship had very good uh, grounds for some uh, success uh, afterwards. And I, I just wonder uh, what about the Chinese situation 
when uh, the party, as you describe it, is partly midrew from uh, local social um, aspects. Uh, what happened then? Uh, was it a, a sort of a situation of learned uh, helplessness? Or um, doesn't it sound right to use such an expression in your uh, context? Uh, well, with the state, I said the tax funded public administration formally. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of influence and activities that are not tax funded and the villages have to find resources for it themselves and fund. Uh, so, and, and the party has never, I don't think withdrawn. It was there and it mm. wasn't there in a sense. Mm. Um, um, so learned helplessness, yes, in a sense of accepting hierarchy and expecting uh, that people in power do their job, take the responsibility. I think that is strong in China. And that is why local protests have been widespread in terms of use of land, and sale of village land that's used rights and turning into private property. And some party caters in common, uh, connection with others do that. And there's been huge protests, many parts of China, and that has been allowed. That critique has been open for that kind of critique and it's been investigated. Um, and that is a sign of no, of this learned helpness, helplessness. Uh, because uh, what I have in mind uh, is some experiences from Sri Lanka and especially the, the plantation sector, where you had the uh, Indian Tamils with uh, no citizenship in Sri Lanka. And the plantation had the responsibility for all aspects of their life, for their work, uh, for uh, education, for health, uh, even uh, for building their religious uh, places and so on, uh, not uh, performing the religious uh, reads. And in such a situation, for example, uh, and housing, I, uh, in such a situation, for example, if it is leaking from your roof, it's not your responsibility. Uh, you don't uh, see that you have an uh, opportunity to, uh, to influence um, in, in such a case, uh, because it is, it's a superintendent, it's a, it's a plantation owner who has a responsibility. I don't know if that is a parallel. The, 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 um, uh, the party didn't have such much power uh, compared to what I, I'm talking about in, in the plantation sector. Because the owner there, they had the total uh, control of almost everything. Uh, depends on which era you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, during the Mao era? And with no, the, I'm talking with about the today. Oh, yeah. you're talking yeah. about yeah. today? Yeah. Uh, I must say it's complicated, I would say. It's not an, an either or. Uh, there are factories where workers are maltreated and don't have a say. Uh, there are examples of that in China. Um, on the other hand, uh, you must please feel in Shishi now. Uh, um, but uh, there are uh, all the People I met, uh, the belonging to some place, to some village or some neighborhood or some larger community meant that you were never fully uh, absorbed mm, in a totalitarian yeah. kind of situation. There was always a way out. Mm. Mm. I don't know. Um, yeah, I think maybe we uh, underestimate the local freedom in China. Mm. There are policies yeah. from the top, yeah. but there is a lot of local uh, freedom as to the execution from local politicians mm. and, and also from for the local people. And I think the um, the business dynamics in China is it's uh, it's very very strong. So I don't think, but this helplessness I don't really I don't see in the same manner as, no, as you described no. from from Sri Lanka. But but another aspect which is quite interesting there was a recent meeting in the uh, Central Committee in China, and there it is 
Of course, it is a goal to build welfare, but it's actually a consciousness uh, from the top in China that if you build too much welfare, uh, you will uh, you will drive laziness. Yeah. So this is not this is not uh, helplessness, but it it is mm. interesting that they are they are very conscious about this um, balance yeah. of helping and uh, to create. Uh, dynamics and growth and personal initiative at the same time. So to balance this, this is very much on the political agenda. Mm. So yeah. Um, and uh, may I have some words? Yes, of course. Yes, uh, yes I listen very carefully for Benedict for the happy situation for some Chinese people, maybe in the uh, rural area or the or in the factory or something like that. Uh, as for me. Uh, I think maybe, um, I don't think it's a kind of uh, phenomenon for people to think that maybe the state, the country has a, a strong power while the people, they are so weak here. For me, I think that maybe it is also sure that this kind of lack of capability for the government to, to governance. Because I think maybe uh, a good governance it cannot. It, it should not be to get rid of this kind of risk for, pe for people. There may be some uncertain factors there. Maybe you should protect them. You should uh, give them more protections there. So uh, it looks like that the, the, the state is very strong. It can do quite a lot of things without question or without uh, limitation. But I think maybe it's another way to show that it uh, actually lack of capability to govern their own people. So I think um, it is kind of situa situation they are real and uh, it is not that good for, uh, for the relations for the guanxi of the state and their people. Because we may say that our, uh, our country should be for the people, by the people, such like this. But I think maybe this kind of situation can be uh, maybe changed or maybe to move into uh, some uh, maybe better direction here. Uh, maybe we need time and maybe we need more uh, encouragement there to do this thing. Yes, I think so. Uh, I noticed one sentence in uh, your book, uh, where you were read, um, writing more represent, uh, repressive towards social entrepre entrepreneurship than earlier. Uh, can you just explain? Well, uh, there are some reports. One example is a new law mm. that allows, not, they don't allow social enterprises to get direct funding from foreign yeah. sources mm -hmm. it has to be trickled from the top exactly. and uh, in a sense that is repressive and it limits the freedom of get, getting resources mm -hmm. and connections with your uh, supporters abroad is one example mm -hmm. uh, that limits mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, centralizes uh, so there are some of those mm -hmm. examples yeah Hmm. Yeah. Do you think it's easier to uh, do social entrepreneurship in low-cost economies than uh, high-cost economies? Could you please? Uh, uh, you know, uh, if you are doing a, a, a social entrepreneurship uh, in a low-cost economy. It's relatively easy to bring in uh, people because the salaries are relatively low. It's, um, it's uh, not very uh, high compared to, for example, in Norway, uh, uh, where some of the competitors will claim that uh, you are subsidizing uh, uh, quite a lot of, of the work. And um, it's uh, not that, that easy, you know. Um. I think that varies uh, that because a lot of work, it depends on volunteers mm. and that creates tensions with employees, yes. mm -hmm. who get wages and who shall get what and how much. Mm. 
uh, and that may be more of an issue in high cost societies with high wages mm -hmm. and then in a context where everyone is more or less poor uh, like Brazil where social entrepreneurship has been part of local uh, welfare systems for decades uh, so yes I think to some extent that is more of a challenge in high cost societies yeah I'm looking at the work share and should we, was it uh, half past we should end or? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, I think it's important that we stick to the schedule. Uh, personally, I would have liked to discuss it this for quite some more time, yes. but uh, uh, I think we should close now. And um, uh, are you the one who thanked, are you the one? Yes. Then, uh, <laughs> Uh, so it has been very interesting listening to Benedicta and also the panel and Shishi here and also the questions from the audience. Uh, for me being born and raised in Macau, listening to the different perspectives has been very interesting for me. And I still remember uh, Chairman uh, Deng Xiaoping, he mentioned that it doesn't matter the cat is white or black, as long as it catches mouses, then it's a good cat. And that represents really a lot what's happening in China. As long as the system works, then the, the, the government will try to encourage it. And if we see the recent development in China where the government trying to suppress the big tech company, the government has a lot of concern on whether or not company grow into a certain size may not be the best benefit to the people. And so social enterprises as a mean to improve the community development, I think that is something the government has been looking into. And thank you so much again, Benedicta, for that contribution. And here, this for you. Thank you. Thank you. And also to the panel. Thank you, thank you so much. And to the house here. And thank you so thank much. You. Congratulations, Paul Benedict. Very interesting book. I really like it. Yes, thank you. Thank you for all your contribution and all our discussions. Yeah, thank you. That's my pleasure. Yes. Research seminars. Thank you. And thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you to all of you who have come here and shared your questions. And uh, uh, I hope you'll continue the interest in uh, yeah, yeah, in this course. topic yeah of course yeah thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. all of you thank you yeah <laughs>